Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. What is going on, everyone? We have hit an all-time low. I am depressed. You can probably hear it in my voice. And I've said this, I feel, I don't know, like 3,000 times already this season. But I don't know how much longer I can do this. You just hit rock bottom. You thought losing 18 games in a row was rock bottom? Try getting dominated for five out of the last six periods against the team that is on one of the most historic losing streaks in NHL recent history. Try being that squad. That's the Philadelphia Flyers. This was ridiculous, and there was some bad puck luck involved, whether it was a shot that hit off of Justin Braun and went in on Brian Elliott. But uh, come on. <laughs> I mean, come on. Come on. Justin Braun. I just praised the guy the other day. Saying, hey, you know what? For as much as I ridicule Justin Braun, look, he stepped into a role, and it's unfortunate he had to. It's not his fault. He's a sixth defenseman that got forced into playing top minutes, and here he is throwing pucks into the shin pad of the Sabres. There goes the other the, the Sabres the other way. Nobody's back-checking. So much time and space. How about Gustafson sitting net front and not picking up sticks? Hello? That's what you're supposed to do. That's your job. Pick up the sticks in front of the net. But no, he just gets destroyed. He just gets annihilated. He just loses every stick battle in the history of the world when it comes to him having to earn space in front of the net. It's a disaster, and it is seriously such a problem. And I keep hearing AV after the game say all of this dumb stuff. For example... The team was ready to play tonight. Uh, what? What are you talking about, dude? How can you properly analyze this team and say that I feel for them? Because I know that they were ready to play. In what universe? What hockey team are you watching? Because all March long, your team was the exact opposite. And I don't feel this is the case of the coach not throwing anyone underneath the bus publicly, all right? I don't think that this is a game Kapler approach. Because even when they were losing games, they said it was him, it was the captain, it was the message by the veterans. We're doing the right things. We're doing the right things to win hockey games. If we continue to do this, we are going to win. So I feel AV is oblivious right now. And that's hard for me to say, considering I love AV. And I thought he was such an awesome coach last year. And that's why I'm not getting behind the whole fire AV train. I can criticize him. I cannot love some of the things that come out of his mouth, that comes out of his mouth, and some of the decisions that he's making. For example, putting Joel Faraby on the fourth line. This dude is something that has been one of the positives all year long, yet you're going to throw him in an area where he's not going to succeed. Let's put our players in the best possible scenarios that they can be in. Let's make sure that we put them in the best spot possible. And he's not doing that with Joel Faraby. Quite frankly, he's not doing that with Oscar Lindblom. The fact that you are now scratching Oscar Lindblom, I'm not a big Oscar Lindblom fan, but he just had, I mean literally just had a ton of success playing with the captain. You're going to move him and play him on a fourth line with scrubs. What do you think is going to happen? All right, I know he's trying to rely so heavily on the veterans right now, but your veterans just got their asses kicked by the Buffalo Sabres that have no clue what they're doing out there. And you could smell this a mile away. When you saw the Flyers come back last game in the third period, when they got destroyed for the first 40 minutes, when you saw them drop the puck tonight at 7.30, did you really think anything else was going to happen? If you thought that this was going to be an easy victory for the Flyers, or if you thought the Flyers were going to come out and grab the two points, shame on you, because this was inevitable. I saw the writing on the wall after last game, when you have this historic comeback that you should have never won in a million years. That game plays out the way that it did last game when they won, when the Flyers came back and won in overtime and Ivan Provorov scored. I'm telling you, 999 times the Buffalo Sabres win that game. It just so happened the one time the Flyers were able to somehow do it. It was all false hope. You knew they were going to get annihilated tonight. I mean, I just had that gut feel all game long. And now, and I saw some of the beat reporters tweet this out as well. Now there's a different demeanor going on. And even AV had a different style to his voice, a different tone, a different energy. Yeah, you just got abused by one of the worst teams ever, and that's low. And now you got to go play the Islanders, and now you got to go play the Boston Bruins in the upcoming week. 
Good luck. And let's get to the Goss Despair news. So they put him on waivers, and there's a little bit of mixed reaction going on. There are some that think that Ghost still has a lot left in the tank, and I'm going to be honest with you. They have tried trading this man for years, literally years, and nobody wants him. Then they put him on waivers, and no one claims him. Stop thinking that Shane Gossespierre is some amazing piece. Is he one of your better defensemen this year? Yes, yeah, sadly, that doesn't mean Shane Gossespierre is good. That just means you are a mess in all your other areas defensively. That's not really to say Shane Gossespierre is some amazing player. But why they moved him and put him on waivers, there has to be a secondary move coming. There's no reason you pick him to be the one that gets waived. Yeah, there's probably a little bit of a statement involved like, yo, fellas, your boy, you guys suck so much. Your boy, a guy who's been around the block for a little bit of time. He's no longer a rookie. He's no longer a younger player. Now, he's not extremely veteran either. He's not to the point of Claude Giroux Voracek. But he's in that in-between. He's been here for a decent amount of time now where he has been a part of the room. He has been a part of the culture. And if you are playing that horrendously, you just costed your boy a chance. But it all comes down to that cap hit, the 4.5. There's something to that and where the Philadelphia Flyers are trying to go with Chuck Fletcher and A.V. Even if A.V. specifically says something about the the move and what that means. He's talking about flexibility. Well, there's a common ground here. There has to be something incoming or else this doesn't make much sense. I would believe that there is a corresponding move that is eventually going to occur from the ghost situation. But if you're someone who believes in ghosts and thinks that this is such a bad idea from the front office perspective and from the Flyers organization, the ghost stinks. Ghost is not good. Don't be skewed by because what's happening this season. You think that Ghost is good because he looks better than Gustafson and Braun and some of these other sloppy guys. Sam Moran, who I don't know what he's doing in the D zone. It's a tough spot for him. Hey, you're playing forward. No, you're playing D. Hey, you're coming back from all these injuries. But at the end of the day, you're out there and you need to make better decisions. How many times are we going to watch Montour get wide open? Come on. I saw guys that blow, I mean literally blow, not Taylor Hall, not their top guys. I'm talking guys who suck in this league, look like they're Mario Lemieux. That's the style of play the Flyers are giving you at this point. Uh, So getting back to AV with this all, uh, because I mentioned the ghost thing, although that's more of an organizational philosophy. I touched on Joel Farabee, his comments about Carter Hart. I didn't have a problem with it, and I even said this after the post-game show last game. I I don't have a problem with letting Carter Hart somewhat rejuvenate again, Uh, but let's be realistic on what we're witnessing. Brian Elliott getting scored on every single game. Brian Elliott getting yanked, being forced to play Alex Lyon. There's a common denominator here. Let's stop acting like this is fully on Carter Hart. And Carter Hart is so atrocious and he's so miserable just because of Carter Hart. Every goalie you're throwing in there, they're allowing five goals. They're allowing too many goals. They're getting scored on easily. Your your defensemen are losing puck battles and stick battles in front of the net. And they're getting great scoring chances. I mean, can we witness this, please? And see that it's every goalie at this point that looks to be underachieving. Now, why is that? Huh, let's take a wild guess on why that is. Maybe it's because of the slop and trash that is in front of them. It's really not that hard to comprehend. And I'm not sitting here saying Brian Elliott is some stud and he doesn't get scored on even normally because he does. And Alex Lyon hasn't played in how long in his NHL career, so you would expect for him to give up some goals. We have enough of a sample size to see that this team continues to allow a ridiculous amount of goals that's crushing the net miners. And why don't we go to Jordan Hall of NBC Sports Philadelphia. He covers the Flyers. He put out a tweet about how many goals this team has been giving up. So in their lot, uh, well, this is a different one, but in their last 19 games, the Sabres have put up four or more goals only two times. Both of those are against the Philadelphia Flyers. That one's even better than the one that I wanted to see. You have, where are we here? Ah, the Flyers lose to the Sabres 6-1. to In March, 
They went 6-10-1 and and allowed the NHL high 4.41 goals per game. The month did serious damage to a season they started with high expectations for. Yeah, you think that also wasn't even the one I was looking for. This is the one I was looking for. The Flyers allowed six or more goals four times in March. They allowed six or more goals five times all last season over a total of 69 games. So it's pretty much 70 games, and that is a bad spot to be in. But like I stated, you could smell this a mile away. And I guess getting to the AV point that I wanted to make with Carter Hart, I'm not mad that they're trying to give him some space and a little bit of a mental step away where you don't have to think about it as much just to retool mentally. You know, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, but I do feel like AV is putting an insane amount of pressure on him more so than anybody else. And maybe he does that because one, he knows that Carter Hart can handle that. And he sees that Carter Hart is an elite, elite player. And he thinks that, hey, I can test this kid compared to a ghost, to Sam Morant, some of these other players that might not have that mental fortitude to be able to handle it. Maybe, look, when you're a coach, you coach players differently. But I do feel when you look at the circumstances here on how this team has played out to this point, let's be realistic on what's happening in front of him too. As much as Carter Hart can be smoother and stronger and take better angles and not get beat glove side as much as he has been because Carter Hart has been bad on top of it. Come on now. I just read you the stats on how many goals this team is allowing. It's not one man's fault. It's not one goalie's fault. And I do want to touch on Sam Carcitti's piece that got ripped apart, which is a joke. It is pathetic that people went after Sam Carcitti for the article that he wrote. Uh, He writes for the Philadelphia Inquirer, covers the Flyers. He does a phenomenal job. And he wrote a story about Carter Hart and his mental coach. He's got a coach, a sports uh, sports psychologist. And they talked about how they separated ways. And now we're looking at Carter Hart, who is somewhat having a tougher time in net. And Sam Carcitti puts it out there and writes a piece about maybe there's a correlation. His job is to talk about the team. His job is to report about the team. The goalie, who we all claim is going to be the future of this franchise, is going through a tough time right now. There's a lot of reasons why that is. But going and diving deeper into the story and realizing that him and his sports psychiatrist are no longer uh, working together like they once did, now you're diving a little bit deeper and finding out why maybe this has happened, finding the correlation, and he's getting abused and annihilated. How dare you talk about the mental health, mental health. Stop. It's a sports psychiatrist, sports psychologist, whatever the fuck it is. It's it's the same as having a trainer and switching trainers, switching a goalie coach. It's a sp- it's someone who helps with the sports psyche of things. Let's not go to this cancel culture of Sam Carcini is now some horrendous reporter because he's talking about Carter Hart and the relationship he had and still has with someone who helps him out with the psyche of the sport. All right, it's not his actual guy that he goes to, woman or or guy or female that he goes to about life. It's his goalie psyche. All right, it's the goalie psyche. It's about his job in between the pipes, in between the crease. It's ridiculous. That is sad that that's where we are at, that he is getting crushed for reporting on the team, reporting on the goalie, because maybe he's talking about something other than what's happening in the blue paint and looking for maybe the correlation between the two. I have no issues with it whatsoever, and that's just pathetic that that's where we are in life these days, and that's my opinion on that. So where else were we? Uh, We talked about, well, we didn't get there yet, but Nolan Patrick scratched. Not too worried about that at all, but it's not like the alternatives are providing anything else. But I thought Nolan Patrick has been so brutal to this point that, yeah, I mean, he deserves it. But Limblom, you're putting yourself in that situation having to scratch him because you're moving around the line so much. And I've, I've been stressing that enough that, Look, you start changing the line too much, you finally found something, and now here's the time to make a decision to move on from uh, two guys that were clicking and playing good hockey, and now you're at the point where you got to scratch them just games later. Don't you think that maybe you should try and put them together a little bit more instead of relying insanely with this veteran core up top? I told you it's not going to work. If you're going to start double shifting your veterans, double shifting your older guys at 30 plus years old and not play anybody else, good luck. You're going to run these guys into the ground and they can't even get past one game. 
You did it once and they won a period. They couldn't even get through a full game with you trying to, to utilize that method of relying so heavily with these top cannon type of players. They ran out of steam and they just got obliterated by the worst team in hockey. Can you believe it? <laughs> oh, God. Can you really believe it? Oh, it's crazy. It really is. I'll tell you what else is crazy, though. DraftKings Sportsbook. 64 teams started off. And now we're at the final four. It has been an amazing ride to this point of the final four, for sure. You got Michigan falling last night. That was a crazy game. UCLA squeaking their way through. Gonzaga looks to be a firepower type of squad. But DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is putting new customers in the center of the action. Bet $1 on any tournament game, and if your team wins, you win $100. It's that simple. Turning $1 into $100 is 100 to 1 odds. Pick any college basketball team that's still in the hunt for your shot at winning $100. All it takes is $1. But don't worry if college basketball isn't for you because DraftKings Sportsbook has daily odds boosts on pro basketball, hockey, golf, and so much more. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code BROADS when you sign up to turn $1 into $100 if the college basketball team of your choosing pulls off the win. That's code BROADS to turn $1 into $100 for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only, new customers only. Restrictions apply in partnership with Metters Racetrack and Casino. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. There was maybe about... What, a handful of minutes there in the second period where the Flyers had a little bit of momentum. They scored the goal to make it 2-1. to one, And then as soon as the Sabres took it back, oh, did they take it back all right. Seriously, though, it looked like the Flyers, all right, here we go. They're going to get a little bit of some offense established. They're going to get some shots on net. And then once the Sabres started taking shots on net again, what do you know? What do you know? <laughs> it's, it's so bad. Oh, I need this fat sip of Pepsi in my life. Yes, I do. So refreshing. By the way, the fact that I'm wearing a Philly Wins hoodie, you can't see this if you're listening to this on the audio podcast, which is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all your podcast podcasting platforms. So make sure you head on over there, leave a five-star rating and a review. That would help out so much. You, you can't see it, though, if, if you are watching or listening, excuse me, on those platforms. Uh, but maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing that you don't see something that says Philly wins because it's a lie. Just like A.V. is throwing lies in your face after the games that this team was prepared to play. In, in what universe do you watch this team's effort level, their compete level, their battling in the corners, their neutral zone play, their offensive zone structure? We know that their D zone's a nightmare. How do you watch every phase of this team and say that they are prepared? It sounds like... Maybe he's trying to defend himself a little bit. And, uh, to think that it's time to fire the coach, though, that's the most irrational Philadelphia Flyers take ever. Show me an organization that just fires coaches every single year and they have a bunch of success. Keep in mind, too, this guy has had a lot of success for a reason. This year is bad. And there's a lot of things that I question. But there's also not many answers. Well, all right, don't put this guy here and don't put that guy here. Like, I want Oscar Lindblom to play with Claude Giroux right now. Do I think that's the difference in winning an insane amount of hockey games? Probably not, because you're still going to allow five goals. So it might not be the fix. It might be better than what he's doing, but I really don't think it's the full-on fix. I think that there's things that he could do better, but I don't think it results in much difference. It's just maybe a better option right now based off of, you know, what worked previously and what's not working now. Uh, but A.V. last year, the same people that won him canned are the same people that loved him last season and said this guy's pushing all the right buttons. It goes back to the players have to go out there and play. And there's only so much you can do from a coaching standpoint. These players are not good enough. Chuck Fletcher did not fill the hole good enough from Matt Niskan in retire, and, and, and it's, it's not easy to do when he just throws it on you like that. Hey, by the way, I'm done my career. Oh, what? Oh, excuse me? I got to go sign Gustafson and, and Justin Braun, and that's supposed to fill the hole of what Matt Niskan in provided? There's just no way. But it is where you're at, and it's... <laughs> my point, though, with A.V. is while I question him, and I think it's fine to criticize him, to start going down the direction of, hey, it's time to fire the coach. Come on, can we please be a little bit more rational about things? It's year two. Year two! Year two! The guy just came off of a season where you praise him for being 
one of the best coaches in the sport. I mean, you're talking about the Jack Adams Award type conversation. And now in one year, he's the dumbest coach to ever live. I'm sorry. I don't think it goes from one extreme to the next. And then also, when you look at the sample size of what he has done in his full career, he has shown that he knows what he's doing. It's just there's not many options right now. And so fair to criticize, fair to get on him, fair to be unhappy with him, fair to yell at him, unfair to say, we got to go hire a new coach. Come on. We're already doing that, huh? Unbelievable. Let's go to the Anytime Hotline. I had a feeling this would happen. I don't know how, I don't know why, but I had the feeling that the Flyers, with the way they were playing this month, were going to break this losing streak for the Buffalo Sabres. And you know what? Fuck gut checks. This is the equivalent of getting your gut pissed, shitted on, and spat on all at the same exact goddamn time. This team deserves this. I don't care what happens to this team at this point. And to all you Claude Giroux haters, if you saw the look on his face at the end of that game, you would realize that Claude Giroux probably would have been a way better player if he was at a way better organization because for the last decade, this organization, for some reason, just can't pull its head out of its goddamn ass. You're not wrong, all right? You are not wrong. You nailed it for sure. The gut check stuff, that's, that's all said and done. When you hear gut check, when you hear all this, I said this five, six, seven games ago. The more and more you hear it, you're supposed to hear that once. You're supposed to hear that twice. You're supposed to answer the bell, and from there, there's no more gut checks, all right? You you completed it. The gut check was finally crossed off. You were able to put a check mark over it. But they don't do that. They don't put the check mark. So 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 gut checks, you're not good. You're a bad hockey team. That's what it is. Gut checks are completed within a very small window after the gut check is there. You can't be games 55 into an 82-game season. I'm just throwing out a normal year, of course. But if you're a game 55 of 82 and you're on your 20th gut check, your team fucking blows. That's what it is. In terms of Claude Giroux's face, I am the farthest thing from a Claude Giroux hater. But this season, yeah, there's something to be said about all of the leadership. Claude Giroux, Jake Voracek, Sean Couturier, JVR. And I know JVR started out hot, but things hasn't been, things have not been as strong for him lately. And and Claude Giroux, while he is the farthest thing from the full on issue, you're not getting enough scoring depth. Your defensive zone is abysmal. Your goalies aren't sharp. I mean, there's a billion reasons why this team is abysmal. It's like last year with the Eagles. Oh, just Carson Wentz sucked. Nope. Doug Peterson sucked. The offensive line sucked due to injuries. The second, like there were players in the secondary that were playing outside corner when they stay, they don't stand a damn chance. So your roster wasn't properly built. Avante Maddox gets torched all the time. Your team all around was a bad football team. To think the four win season fell on one individual is a joke. But when you look at this team, the scoring depth is a nightmare. Players aren't stepping up. The coach isn't making strong decisions. The goalies could be better. The D zone is the worst defensive core I've ever seen in. In hockey, so there's all these reasons why. So I'm not going to put the full on blame on Claude Giroux, but when it gets this bad, everyone deserves a piece of the pie. So Claude Giroux does deserve a piece of the pie, even though he can't fix it on his own. It's impossible to fix this with one man, especially a forward. What's a forward going to do? And I do want to date back to something I said after last game when Justin Braun and Scott Lawton were the two guys to step up and say something, and it wasn't AV and it wasn't Claude Giroux. I heard an interesting take that I think is very valid. I was a little disappointed that G wasn't the one to be vocal, but maybe there's something to be said about this. If you say something for 25 games and the message clearly isn't getting through to your players— It's time for someone else to step up. It's time for a different voice. It's time to see, well, hold on, Justin Braun? Scott Lawton? These are the guys with the voice? There's a different message being sent when it's a different guy. So maybe with Claude Drew, who supported it on the on the ice, by the way, he walked the walk in that third period, which is way more important to me than talking the talk, even though I would want him to be that vocal leader in the room. After, let's say, 30, 40 games, going back to the analogy of the gut check, if it's Claude Giroux every single time and the message isn't getting across, not because he's a bad captain, but because at some point, just like with uh, A.V., the message from A.V. isn't getting through. It doesn't mean A.V.'s a bad coach. Actually, his stats will tell you otherwise. His resume will tell you otherwise. It's just it's not getting through. It's not resonating. It happens all the time. Greg Popovich, he doesn't have a winning season every single damn year. 
Does he have a message that works? Yeah. Does it get through all the time? No, not necessarily. Not every season you need superstar talent, and he doesn't seem to have that anymore, and it's a different version of Spurs basketball. Message doesn't get across the same way. We are seeing that with Claude, possibly, and that's why Lawton and Justin Braun had to step up because with this team this season not resonating. Last year, though, it sure did with very similar guys in the room. But that culture inside where they were all buddy buddies and they were a family and they were brothers, I don't think it's the same level anymore. So the Flyers got their asses handed to them by the fucking shitty Buffalo Sabres. Again. But I didn't call here to talk about this fucked up game or this team. Calling to beg you, don't stop doing the, the podcast, please. Being up here in Canada, this is the only Flyers fix I get. I love that you drink the Timmies every morning. I love the broadcast. I love the show. I love what you're doing. I know it's hard to watch, but just hang in there, bro. It's Thank you so much for the kind words. I really do appreciate that. I did not expect hearing that. Uh, I thought we were just going to rant and rave about the Flyers, but it is tough. I'm not going to lie to you. It is getting a little brutal, and with the Phillies starting, there's going to be a lot more on the table, so uh, I I will try my best. I will try my full-on best to do what I can with this team if this continues, but uh, there is going to be a point. I mean, if it's 6-1, 6-1, 6-1, 6-1, and it gets to this level of just brutalness, I I don't know. I really, I flat out don't know, but I am going to full-on commit to saying I will try my best to stay involved as much as possible with this nonsense that they put us through. But yes, I do love I do love a nice Timmy Hortons in the morning. It is fantastic. I went to Calgary when I visited Johnny Gaudreau over last Christmas. I went to Banff. I went to Lake Louise. It was all beautiful. But when I went out to Calgary, when I get my Timmy Hortons every morning, I, I-, I stayed with him. Uh, my fiance and I, we went together, we stayed at his place, but we would leave his place, we'd walk to Timmy Hortons, oh, it was just the best ever, so I have to do that now with, during Coffee with Broach and all the Timmy Hortons, bring that Canada with me and all, and I don't know how we got sidetracked, that was nice, it was kind of refreshing actually to just not think about the Flyers logo for about, I don't know, what was that, 15 to 20 seconds, but now the hatred is burning through my blood again, and here we go with the next call. Holy shit, bro, we just got shut out the worst team in hockey, and we were talking about being cop contenders. The defense is fucking dog order, and don't even, don't even get me started on Braun the Bum. But we got to go baseball tomorrow. Ring the bell and fuck the Flyers. <laughs> oh, no. How did we do this? You're right. You're right. Six to one. I didn't even think about the fact that they seriously almost just got shut out. In what, in what world are we watching a team get so beat up by the fucking Buffalo Sabres to the point where the Sabres look like one of the best teams in hockey? Did they not? They, they were cruising. They were winning battles. They were moving the puck. You got pucks. You're in the offensive zone, right? If you're the Buffalo Sabres, you're in the offensive zone. You got the puck in the corner. You're passing it in the slot, right in the high slot area. Guys are winning their battles, stick lifting, putting it on Brian Elliott, scoring with ease, celebrating smiles on their faces, scoring short-handed backhand goals, Montour finding a way. Oh, they were bing, bang, boom. Oh, it looked so good. Oh, it was so beautiful from a Buffalo Sabres perspective. How did that happen? How did it look so clean? And realistically, the first 40 minutes of the first game they played a a night ago, was it not the same? Was I not saying the same thing? The Sabres actually looked like they had control. The Sabres actually looked like they knew how to make a pass, and they knew how to enter a zone, and they were on man rushes, and someone drove the net, and there was a high guy, or they moved the puck up high. They got screens in front of the net. They were tipping pucks. They were hitting. They were being physical. How about the fact that I saw Alex Lyon fall over because they were crashing the net hard, and no one did a damn thing. Then the second time it happened, there was a bit of a response. The first time, not so much, a little hack. The second time, more of a response. Excuse me, as Pepsi's coming out of my nose, and I'm burping, and Jesus. So that's where the Flyers are. I'm burping during the podcast uh, because they deserve it. I wish it was throw up. I wish it was vomit. They deserve that more. 
how can you possibly not stand up for a third string goalie that hasn't been playing hockey in how long? Like he's just going to get beat up and physically torn down by this team, by this trash team. You're going to allow that to happen? And then when the second time, it, when they there was a little bit more of sticking up for him, I'm sure Carter Hart w- was thinking, "Hey guys, where's that for me, jerk offs?" All I can say is, thank God Philly season starts tomorrow. And they'll probably go out there and ruin it for me as well. But in a season of low points, these last two games truly show you just how bad, how wretched this hockey team really is. To come back from the dead to beat them the other night and then to go out there and embarrass yourselves once again. I mean, it's just pure manure. If I'm Chuck Fletcher, yeah, I'm going to be active at the deadline, but I'm selling. I'm selling high, low, and all points in between. Well, the reason why I think you're going to have a tough time doing that is he specifically stated, Chuck Fletcher specifically said, I'm not getting calls. My phone is not ringing. Do people want any of these players? I mean, everyone wants to talk about breaking up the core, this and that. No one wants Jake Voracek's contract. Claude Giroux has a no-trade clause. You're not getting rid of Sean Couturier, a Selkie winner. That would be silly. So your core, your quote core, those are those guys. I mean, if you want to look at Travis Konechny and Oscar Lindblom and Nolan Patrick and and any of these other players, I I mean, that's not really the core. So if you're trading some of these other guys, okay. But the core, nobody wants the core. No one wants them. So I don't know if Chuck Fletcher's going to be able to do it. There's a reason why he said my phone ain't ringing. And guess what? He wasn't doing that as a smoke screen. Because, hey, what's that going to do? That's nothing. There's no benefit to that. And my phone's not ringing. So what? There may be people calling. You would say my phone's ringing out my ass. Because maybe that, oh, hold on. Who's calling you? Oh, geez. Oh, I didn't know they were calling you. Or, oh, they're calling them. Oh, the Flyers are getting a lot of buzz. Maybe we should check in, too. Let's see what they have to offer. If other people are interested or... Hey, who are they? Konechny? Oh, hi, this guy. That guy. Oh, okay. No one's calling. I think it tells you everything you need to know. I'll tell you what you should call, though. Uh, Orbit Energy and Power. With over 20 years of experience in the solar industry, Orbit Energy and Power is home to your solar experts in residential and commercial projects. Their solar program eliminates your electric bill completely. They offer flexible financing solutions such as $0 down. In addition, they make sure you receive all the state and federal incentives available for switching to solar. There's no risk and no need for investment. They also provide water purification systems, backup energy services, battery storage, and more. So check out their information. It's all down below. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time.